Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the KPMG's presentation on the Union Budget of 22-23. Uh, let, let's get started. Uh, if you can move on the slides, please. Uh, me and my colleagues will take you through uh, the salient aspects of uh, the various aspects of the budget uh, and, and different speakers will come at different points in time. Moving on. The areas that we will cover is of course, corporate and direct tax, uh, taxes that impact the financial services sector, uh, any aspects on the m &A tax side, the personal taxes, the indirect taxes, and what's our overall take uh, on the budget. That's what we propose to cover in next one hour. Moving on. Move on. Before we get started on what's been presented in this budget, let's have a very quick look as to what has been happening since the last budget, uh, since 2021 budget. Uh, of course, we are coming close to 24 months of going through this pandemic, and that has obviously impacted the biggest uh, aspect of our personal and economic life. Uh, we saw the economy contract uh, in 2021. Uh, we, of course, saw all the human and economic impact, whether for our corporate life, business life, or our personal life, and the health issues uh, with various uh, waves of, of, you know, of this pandemic. Uh, we also saw a global surge in commodity pricing, uh, which were fueled by high fuel prices, uh, which resulted in inflationary pressures. There were global supply chain disruptions. So various factors contributed to the surge in and global commodity pricing. Uh, there are also impact uh, which are expected and, and have been felt on account of uh, policies by the uh, by Feds on you know the interest rates. So that's been an impact that we feel uh, here at home. Uh, on the other hand, we saw in this budget there has been and over months we've seen the collection that there has been a beyond expected growth in the both direct and indirect tax revenues uh, as on December 2021. In fact, we saw in the speech that the January data for uh, GST, uh, which was presented, which has been the highest ever GST collection in a particular month. Uh, so all those trends are encouraging. Uh, and of course, we are all aware that while uh, the country is going through an Omicron wave, but the the effects of them have been relatively milder in terms of impact on, on people. Uh, and that's something that's visible to all of us. That's the context in which this year's budget uh, needs to be analyzed. Moving on. We all saw the uh, economic survey being presented. Uh, I'm sure people are aware, but just to you know, highlight some of the key points here uh, that the GDP uh, growth expected uh, is 9.2 for 21 to 22. And that sets the stage for 22 to 23 at 8 plus percent. That's Those are the data as presented uh, by the economic survey. Uh, the India's balance of payment uh, has been good. In fact, throughout this period of pandemic, our foreign exchange reserves have been rising. Uh, the strong revival in revenues and the economic service says that provides a government some fiscal space to, to you know, extend additional uh, support or benefits. Uh, we are yet to see what the government is planning to do about that. The economic survey uh, asserts that the banking system is well capitalized. Uh, the India's capital market, like many global markets, have done exceptionally well. Of course, that's something that we all have been tracking on a daily, weekly basis. Uh, the economic survey does flag global resurgence of inflation, warns of imported inflation. Uh, some part of the inflation is good for the economy, but the minute it goes beyond a certain level, it starts to have adverse impact. And of course, the economic uh, survey asserts that the Indian economy is well placed to take on the challenges of the coming year, and the growth has been packed between 8 to 8.5%. Uh, of course, there is a huge mention about the coverage of the vaccine, and that certainly is a factor being considered not just on the welfare and health issue, but also the effect on the economy. Uh, moving on, uh, before we get into the actual uh, proposals uh, on, on the direct and indirect tax side, I think there were a couple of announcements that uh, I feel are worthy of, of noticing in the context of the economic environment. Uh, of course, the announcement on accelerated corporate exits is something that should be welcomed by, by Corporate India. Uh, it has been a long-standing uh, you know, ask that 
while the whole process of entry or setting up a company has been eased over a period of time, exit is still a very time consuming process. So more details are awaited, uh, but something that is a step in the right direction. Uh, there was an announcement about the Special Economic Zone Act to be overhauled and replaced. And there are many related developments that need to happen, whether it is in terms of IT enablement of all the processes and the way the customs department will get you know, reorganized uh, for that process. So interesting details are yet to emerge. Uh, this whole focus on Atman Nirva Bharat and therefore 68% of the defense procurement will be from domestic company is again step in the direction of Atman Nirva Bharat. Also, all the announcements that have been made on boosting private investment, and there was an announcement about setting up a committee to look into the venture capitalists and private equity funds. And of course, last but not the least, a very interesting announcement about digital rupee, uh, and that opens up a brand new chapter on our economic life, uh, things that we will uh, eagerly await to get more details on. Uh, moving on, uh, I would like to invite uh, my colleague Gaurav Mandiratta to take us through the proposal on the direct tax act. Gaurav, over to you. Gaurav can't hear you. Uh, we are still not able to hear. Or if you may want to speak through the computer microphone instead of the polycom, if you're on polycom, that might work. You can try that. Gaurav, may I also recommend that maybe we move to Sunil uh, and let him cover, take us through the financial services and we'll come back to you. you can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah, Gaurav, we can hear you now. Okay, so let me just go first. I'm sorry about this uh, technical glitch. Uh, so, you know, thank you, Rajiv, uh, and good day to all the participants around the globe. Uh, now, before I talk about the budget changes, a bit of a recap on the last year. Uh, if I were to talk about an exceptional year on front of, um, you know, on the front of international taxation, uh, in the career of uh, more than 25 years that I've had, 2021 uh, would stand out. 137 member jurisdictions of of the OECD, representing more than 90% of global GDP, approved several aspects uh, of a framework for reforming the international tax systems. Uh, specifically talking about the two pillars, uh, pillar one uh, for taxing evolving digital economy, whereby India already took a proactive step by introducing equalization levy a few years back. And also pillar two, uh, which provides for a minimum global tax rate of 15% for multinational enterprises. As the rules are still being finalized, uh, we should expect uh, some changes to come in uh, in the next uh, budget. Though a bit disappointing uh, that uh, there were certain expectations uh, that there might be clarifications which may come in uh, on account of uh, equalization levy, especially how it impacts, uh, you know, sale of goods and a few other kind of transactions. Uh, that doesn't seem to have come out. But back home, uh, if you look at it, the government's been proactive in making a lot of amendments. So if you looked at uh, nullifying the retrospective applicability of indirect transfer of shares, I think this was something uh, which was long, long overdue, and 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 uh, you know, it was a widespread apprehension of foreign investors. Uh, I know it comes with some riders, but but at least a good move uh, on part of uh, the government to just get uh, rid of it. Uh, it was also a year where, uh, where uh, you know, uh, there were significant rulings, uh, specifically from the Supreme Court, uh, settling the longstanding issue of uh, taxation of income from sales of software uh, and a few others, and a, a few other constructive decisions like applicability of MFN clause and treaties, uh, validity of some reassessment notices uh, post March uh, 21. One more move, and I think personally, uh, uh, it's very close to my heart, uh, is the fact that the advanced rulings have not really been working, and uh, the notification of e-advanced ruling schemes uh, coming in really recently, and uh, and and hopefully uh, we should uh, 
kickstart the whole BAR process as we go along. Uh, we understand that the three BARs have been formed uh, and should get into action uh, soon in uh, February. So it's only been four hours since the budget's been pronounced and uh, you know, FM's uh, theme was trustworthy tax uh, you know, regulation or administration. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and, and I think they've kept up to that theme. If you see most of the changes have come in uh, in light of uh, you know, this theme. But as they say, devil lies in the details. So uh, let me take you through uh, the various changes. So what we've done is we just split it uh, in terms of promoting investments and dispute resolution and how, how do we uh, look at that. So first of all, uh, you know, Prime Minister's uh, key uh, you know, pillar has been Make in India. Uh, not much happened between 2014 and 19, but since 2019, uh, uh, there's been a lot of push I personally work uh, a lot on the defense sector and, and you know, there's been so many policy, uh, policy announcements that have been made, uh, you know, which will now, and, and, and Rajiv talked about it, 68% of capital procurement is gonna be made from India, but it requires a gestation period and especially during COVID time. Uh, so the expectation of industry though was that the 15% rate, which, uh, you know, came in in uh, mid of uh, 2019, will get extended uh, to, uh, uh, to 2025, maybe it does in the next year, but right now uh, it has got extended uh, to um, 31st March, 2024. So any new manufacturing unit, uh, which comes into operation uh, uh, till March, 2024, will uh, now see uh, uh, you know, a 15% uh, uh, tax rate. Uh, the second one, the other theme, uh, startups, and and you know we are uh, all watching the you know the Indian Shark Tanks, and we see the kind of value that they've all been creating, uh, and and uh, that also while while this is only for companies with uh, with a turnover of uh, less than hundred crores, uh, and and registered with the government, uh, but uh, it's a welcome move that the tax exemption, which is there for three years out of a block of ten years, uh, that has moved. Uh, to, uh, you know, by a year. So it was supposed to end. There was a sunset clause till March 2023. That has uh, now changed to uh, March uh, uh, 22 and now it's changed to March 23. Long-term capital gains, uh, uh, the surcharge uh, on, uh, you know, uh, sale of listed securities, uh, uh, now that, uh, you know, it's taxable at the rate of 10%, uh, the, the surcharge is, uh, you know, capped at 15%. And therefore, to bring in parity uh, in relation to uh, other long-term investments that one has, and specifically looking at investments in uh, unlisted securities and otherwise, uh, the rate of surcharge has been reduced uh, from 37 to 15%. Now, while it's only a change of a surcharge reduction, but it still brings down the effective tax rate uh, on, on such uh, gains uh, by four and a half to 5%. Sec uh, the, the other uh, part, again, on surcharge uh, reduction from 37 to 15%, again, is a move which is uh, very important, especially India is looking at a lot of construction contracts coming in. Uh, and therefore, uh, therefore, you know, when you form a consortium of companies coming together and getting taxed, uh, it is uh, uh, currently the surcharge is 37%. And even if you look at all of them consortium members being being Indian companies, uh, the, the effective tax rate could go up to 42.78%. Uh, now that is going to come down to 35.9. So again, a 6 to 7% effective tax rate uh, uh, reduction uh, here. Moving on, um, I think, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the finance minister uh, really talked about, uh, you know, looking at areas of, of uh, of, of effective dispute resolution. Uh, I think there are various steps in this budget which have been made and, and, and quite noteworthy uh, steps. Uh, first of all, uh, in all the cases that we, you know, and as our, our taxpayers here uh, representing our corporates uh, or, or individual taxpayers, uh, all uh, cases, whether it's one in the, uh, at any level, gets disputed by the tax authorities at a higher level. So a new scheme uh, is coming, uh, has been brought in as part of the budget, where if there is an identical issue, which is pending in the high court or the Supreme Court, and it's a question of law, not a factual matter, but it's a, a question of law, then 
this is, uh, so, you know, some senior, uh, and, and that collegium is going to be decided, uh, the constitution of that collegium is going to be decided, but they could take a call along with the assessing officers uh, that the, uh, uh, they will not file an appeal, assuming the same question of law is pending before any other high court or with the Supreme Court. Of course, this needs to be done uh, with the, you know, consent of the, of the, tax, uh, of the taxpayer. Uh, the next one uh, is around the faceless assessment scheme. Uh, and there are uh, 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 quite a few updations that uh, have been made uh, in the budget. Uh, while again, as I mentioned, it's only been for us. Uh, so a lot more will come out. But uh, first of all, uh, there were a lot of cases where, uh, where the procedure was not followed. And, and that was part of the faceless assessment scheme. Uh, the, the assessments were treated as uh, null and void. Uh, that has been deleted from a retrospective effect. Uh, they will not be treated as null and void now, but will be assessed on merits uh, and by you know uh, looking at those technical faults and those will be taken care of. Uh, so that's a big amendment. The other one, I, and I think it's somewhere a welcome move. Uh, the government has recognized that faceless assessment scheme, scheme while going, you know, they're going full scheme uh, on it, but certain uh, matters specifically transfer pricing, international tax, um, and, uh, you know, uh, and also tribunal uh, really require uh, a bit more effort uh, and also uh, will require one system changes, which are more effective and also the understanding uh, at the part of the uh, revenue authorities. So that um, amendments come in and now uh, this change, which was supposed to come in from March, 2022, has been extended uh, by uh, another couple of years. So it's now extended to March, 2024. And also uh, there are uh, the, the, the new uh, guidelines talk about uh, a better coordination between the various uh, units of uh, the uh, faceless assessment schemes, uh, which work behind the scenes. Moving on uh, again, something very interesting uh, and which we've never seen before. Uh, and maybe we'll stay in the, earlier slide, um, option, uh, there is now an option to file an updated return uh, within two years from the end of the assessment year. So today you can either file a belated return or you one can file uh, uh, you know, a revised return. But uh, if the assessee believes that there has been something that they missed out and, and, and they want to disclose that income, it's somewhere like a voluntary disclosure. Uh, scheme. They want to disclose that it's an open-ended scheme now that the uh, taxpayers can go in and file that along with an additional payment, uh, which is 25% uh, if the return is being filed within one year from the end of the assessment year, or 50% of the tax and the interest amount if the uh, return is being filed within 24 months. Now, of course, there are riders attached to it that it should not result in actually increasing of refund or reduction of income, and such re uh, returns uh, cannot be filed if the assessments have been uh, initiated uh, or uh, you, you know already being completed. Uh, moving on, moving on to the next. Uh, there's this very interesting um, a change, and, and these are a few uh, uh, secondary, I would say, but important amendments may not apply to everyone, but looking at certain sectors like the FMCG sectors, TDS will now apply uh, in relation to any benefits or perquisites that uh, business provides uh, to, to people they deal with. So assuming an FMCG company provides certain samples, certain uh, you know, some kind of uh, travel kind of a benefit uh, uh, to the uh, to their dealers. Uh, on that, they'll now have to withhold TDS at the rate of 10%, uh, like a benefit or a perquisite. Now, this could be a significant cost increase uh, in the hands of some companies, specifically in the area, as we mentioned, uh, around FMCG or otherwise. Uh, the other big change, and I uh, you know, dividends from foreign companies uh, where where there is an Indian investor and uh, invests um, in a foreign company and has investment more than 26%. A few years back, 
the government looking at parity between dividend distribution tax of 15% um, had come up uh, with a beneficial provision that uh, the dividend, such dividend will be taxed at 15% in the hands of the Indian shareholder when they're receiving dividends uh, from, from foreign, uh, uh, you know, their foreign investments. That uh, is now changing back since dividend is now taxable in the hands uh, uh, otherwise uh, at the maximum marginal rate, this will also uh, now be uh, taxable at maximum marginal uh, rate. And therefore, uh, therefore, you know, that's, uh, you know, a bit of a dampener from uh, when, when one is looking at uh, investment, uh, outbound investment, a lot of companies now, including startups and otherwise, looking at expanding overseas. So this could have uh, a pretty uh, negative impact uh, in, in, in those cases. The other one uh, is around, uh, you know, this dispute that uh, came about, uh, of, you know, since the uh, last few years, whether surcharge or CES, uh, education CES uh, uh, and health CES, uh, whether that is allowable as a, a business income. Uh, there were certain court rulings uh, which went ahead and, and, and actually uh, adjudicated in favor of taxpayer that this is not tax based on the current definition of the uh, of the income tax uh, act and uh, therefore uh, uh, you know uh, that deduction was allowed to the taxpayers this is one retrospective amendment that the uh, government has uh, uh, you know made now whereby this uh, uh, says is now will be uh, subject to uh, a tax and with retrospective effect from 2005 and therefore there will have to be division of income where that position has been taken. Uh, the other I would say are, are, are miscellaneous provisions and therefore I don't want to get into it uh, in detail and I, in the interest of time I'd like to pass it, this on uh, to my BFSI partner uh, Sunil Badala to take over the important changes from the financial services sector. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gaurav, and uh, good day to all the participants. Uh, just one minute. Sorry, for some reason, my video is not uh, switching on, but okay, anyway, in the interest of time. So, you, you know, uh, I think Rajiv talked about some of the important, uh, you know, announcements. Uh, you know, before I get into the, the you know, direct X, uh, you know, changes from a, uh, I mean, I mean, from a, a BFSI perspective, there are a couple of, uh, you know, important uh, regulatory announcements, which have really caught my attention. One is, uh, you know, uh, in order to actually give the financial inclusions, all the post offices uh, and all the branches of the post office, they will actually be brought into the core banking system. Uh, which means that the you know post office branches will actually effectively be working like banks. They can provide uh, you know ATM facilities, mobile banking, uh, you know inter post office branches transfers, uh, transfers between post office and the banks, etc. So I thought it was a very very uh, big uh, announcement uh, from a from a banking perspective, and it obviously will give a uh, huge impetus to the financial inclusion. Uh, there was also announcement on, uh, you know, digital banking branches. Uh, uh, so it was, it was mentioned that in the 75 districts across the country, the digital banking branches will be allowed to be open. Of course, we are awaiting more details around that. There, will, uh, there was also announcement on, you know, ability to issue green bonds uh, for the for the social ventures uh, and also the IRDA has actually given the framework to the government to actually issue uh, surety bonds and you know to replace the bank guarantee which actually companies are giving. So again, some more details are awaited, but I thought these were very very important and uh, you know relevant announcements from a uh, from a uh, you know financial service sector uh, you know point of view. Now moving on to the direct tax uh, you know proposals, I think there are three or four key amendments which have been proposed. One is obviously everyone was talking about uh, the taxation of uh, digital currencies. Uh, you know, uh, obviously uh, in the in the finance bill, they've they have uh, uh, talked about virtual digital asset, which is 
actually uh, uh, a very wide definition. Not only it includes the, the you know, cryptocurrencies, but also it actually includes uh, things like uh, NFTs and other digital assets. So uh, let's say even if uh, you actually uh, you know, issue uh, you know, non-fungible tokens uh, at the back of uh, you know, artwork or you know, heritage buildings, paintings, et cetera, those will actually get covered by the uh, uh, you know, definition of virtual digital assets VDA. Uh, what it excludes is the Indian currencies and foreign currencies as defined under FEMA. Uh, now, what uh, the taxation framework provides is a straight 30% tax effective uh, 1 April 22. So any income arising on transfer of uh, you know, uh, VDA, uh, it will be subject to tax at uh, 30% without any deduction on account of expense. The only deduction which will be available will be the cost of acquisition or you know, cost that you incurred, uh, incurred to acquire the uh, the you know digital asset. Uh, also, they have they have uh, you know provided for a complete ring fencing, which means that if there is any loss that you have incurred on sale of uh, digital assets, that loss will only be allowed to be set off against uh, the profits of the digital assets and not against any other uh, capital gains under any other heads. Uh, it is not yet clear as to whether can you set off the the you know loss arising from one digital asset against other uh, you know I mean uh, digital assets uh, because there is a bit of an issue on the language but I think we'll get some more clarity as we progress. Uh, also, there is a uh, there is a provision that if you gift a digital asset to another person under Section fifty six two ten the value of uh, the digital assets will be taxable in the hands of the donor or in the hands of the recipient. Uh, now, again, there's no clarity as to what happens when the recipient of the, um, of the, of the gift, when he or she sells uh, these uh, assets, whether they can claim the, the deduction on account of cost, which would have been in, incurred by the donor, uh, because there's no specific provision. So there can be potential risk of a double tax uh, there. Uh, they also provided for a TDS of 1% on the, on the gross consideration of the VDA uh, if it is in excess of uh, uh, 10,000 rupees. Uh, now, this can again create some bit of an issue, especially where you are, let's say, transferring one digital asset in consideration of acquiring another digital asset. So first of all, you know, there will be two transactions and therefore there'll be two TDS. Both the parties will have to ensure that, you know, TDS is actually deducted and, uh, you know, deposited. If there's no money to actually pay the TDS, then the, the, the you know, parties of the transactions have to ensure that the, uh, you know, counterparty has actually paid the tax. Now, what do you mean by you know paying the tax? Does it mean that you know the you know counterparty should pay actually a TDS of one percent or the applicable tax on the transaction? Uh, so again, some uh, uh, you know some uh, clarity is actually required, but it will be interesting to see how all these issues actually are going to pan out. Uh, there was another uh, you know small amendment. Uh, you know, in the context of Section 43B, as you are all aware that, you know, when you make payment of interest to the banks or other financial institutions, the deduction is allowed only when you actually make the payment of interest. Uh, there were companies which actually uh, converted those interest liabilities into, uh, you know, further borrowings or issued debentures in, in relation to the, you know, interest liability. Now, it has been clarified and you know uh, so uh, i mean there were some uh, some you know court uh, uh, you know decisions some precedents which actually indicated that if there is a conversion of the interest liability into into loans or debentures then that will be effectively treated as a deemed payment and therefore the reduction under section 43b should be allowed 
Now that has been sought to be plugged and uh, what they have uh, clarified is that even if you convert the interest liability into debenture, it will not be considered as a deemed payment and therefore a disallowance under section 43B will have to be made. Uh, moving on to the next slide. I think this is another important theme and you know, uh, you've all seen for last few years, we've been seeing a lot of amendments, uh, you know, a lot of exemptions, incentives to be provided to International Financial Service Center, uh, you know, popularly known as a uh, as gift city in, in Gandhinagar, Gujarat. Uh, so, you know, uh, of course, before, uh, you know, getting into the incentives, there was an announcement that, uh, you know, foreign universities and institutions will be allowed to be set up in the IFSC. Uh, of course, we, we you know, await more details. And also a very interesting announcement, and I think a good one, is that International Arbitration Center will also be allowed to be set up in the IFSC. Moving on to the tax proposals, uh, you know, uh, so, so there is a tax exemption which is proposed to be provided to, to you know, non-resident uh, taxpayers on any income arising from the transfer of offshore derivative instruments or over-the-counter, uh, you know, derivatives. Let me just explain. So, so, so for example, let's say there is a banking unit or uh, banking branch in the IFSC. If it enters into uh, a, an over-the-counter derivative like uh, currency uh, swap or interest rate swap uh, with a non-resident uh, counterparty, the income arising to the non-resident on account of those uh, uh, you know, over-the-counter derivatives will be exempt. Also, if let us say this uh, banking branch in, uh, in the IFSC were to issue offshore derivative instru uh, instruments, which are popularly, popularly known as, uh, you know, uh, P-notes, at the back of, uh, uh, you know, Indian government bonds or state development loans, then income arising in the hands of the non-resident on account of these P notes or these offshore derivative instruments will not be subject to tax. Also, the non residents uh, will be allowed to access the services or facilities of the PMS, uh, you know, portfolio management service providers set up in IFSE. And if they open a bank account with, uh, uh, I mean, with a bank set up in IFSE, and if the PMS uh, provider actually invest in the overseas securities or financial products. And if the non-resident earns any income on those overseas securities or financial products, then that income will again be exempt in the hands of the non-resident. Uh, also on the power of aircraft uh, leasing incentives, they have extended those incentives to the shipping industry. So if you lease any ship, uh, in the uh, in the IFSC or from the IFSC, any royalty or interest uh, in the context of a finance lease, it will be interest in the context of operating lease, it will be royalty. So any income in the hands of the non-resident on account of these royalties and interest income on the leasing of ships will not be subject to tax. Also, they have given full exemptions on capital gains arising on transfer of these ships uh, in, the, in the IFSC. So moving on to the next uh, slide, uh, the, the you know, last important uh, amendment from a financial uh, service point of view is on account of bonus stripping. So currently, as you know, that if you were to you know, acquire the units of the mutual fund within three months from the record date of announcing bonus, uh, and you were to sell those uh, you know, units within nine months after the record date, then it is considered as bonus stripping and the anti-abuse provisions uh, get triggered. And if you suffer any loss on account of sale of those units, then those, uh, I, I mean, those losses are actually ignored. Uh, so obviously, you, know, you have to satisfy both the conditions. A, you have to acquire within three months before uh, the record date and you have to sell it within nine months after the record date. Now, this bonus stripping provisions have been also extended to all kinds of units issued by AIFs, INWITs, REITs, 
and any other securities, which means even shares of companies, if you acquire within three months from the record date or sell um, and sell after nine months from the record date, and you have, uh, you know, companies have announced bonus issues and you have sold those uh, shares and therefore you have suffered any losses, those losses will be ignored. So we've just given, you know, examples in, in three different scenarios uh, just to kind of explain as to how it will work. Uh, and of course, whatever loss that you suffer, it will be considered as, you know, cost of acquisitions when you sell the, you know, second lot of, uh, you know, shares or units. I think uh, those were the uh, main, uh, you know, amendments which have been proposed from a financial service uh, sector point of view. Uh, with that, let me hand it over to Vivek to, to you know, discuss uh, some of the amendments proposed uh, which are relevant for the MNA sector. Over to you, Vivek. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, hopefully I'm audible. Mm -hmm. So I will, I will, over the course of the next five minutes, try and cover some of the amendments from a M&A and private equity standpoint. If you could move on to the main slide, please. So from an M&A and PE tax standpoint, I think this is very much an invest in India budget. So we've heard make in India, we've heard uh, start up in India, but fundamentally the theme behind this budget is that this is an invest in India budget. And I say this for two or three specific reasons. First of all, I think the government has realized that the whole process of capital formation is what triggers what the finance minister called the virtual cycle, virtuous cycle today. And therefore, the government has stood up to increase its own capex spend pretty significantly. Uh, to move the capex spend over seven and a half lakh crores uh, is a very, very welcome step. And I think it unleashes enough capital in the economy for it to become interesting for various players to, uh, to indulge in M&A across the board. The second and perhaps the most important announcement uh, from a government standpoint on the M&A side was the fact that the government has uh, addressed the long-standing demand of the private equity and venture capital community to agree to now evolve a regulatory and tax framework which will encourage such investment. Now, in terms of context, in the current financial year, we've had more than $60 billion of private equity and venture capital inflows. Contrast this with the fact that two or three years ago, we would say that the maximum amount of uh, FDI through private equity and venture capital would be somewhere in the region of 15 to 20 billion. Effectively, this 15 to 20 billion has moved to 60 plus billion, has tripled. So the government recognizes the importance of this asset class. The government also recognizes that with the liquidity that exists around the world, there is an opportunity that India can attract more than $100 billion of private equity and venture capital uh, in, in, into this country. And therefore, the government has said that they will form an expert committee to look at all taxation and regulatory aspects in relation to private equity and venture capital. Uh, it is our belief that this will cause a comprehensive review of the entire framework for foreign domicile funds, as well as the Indian domiciled AIFs. Uh, we expect that, uh, that the ease of doing business for the private equity and VC community will be significantly enhanced as a result of, of this measure. The last thing uh, from an Invest in India budget perspective well, is the change in PSU disinvestment and the fact that if a company were to now buy an asset from, a, uh, from the government as part of the disinvestment program, uh, the, the framework for carry forward of past tax NOLs uh, increase, uh, has been uh, strengthened and therefore the government will be able to derive the value of the tax losses when the actual sale occurs. So for these three reasons, we believe that this is clearly an invest in India budget. Uh, my colleague Gaurav already spoke about the fact that the surcharges have been brought down. So startup exits, real estate transactions, I think both will, uh, both will become more interesting uh, with the surcharge now coming down from 37 to 15% in terms of long-term capital gains tax. 
Kudul amortization, another, another change that has been made in Section 50 of the Act. Effectively, this is a change that was signaled last year already. This is a clarificatory change which seeks to provide a full regime to say that if the goodwill is subtracted from the block and if a short-term capital gains uh, results therefrom, it will indeed be seen as a transfer. So the goodwill amortization, I think, is more a clarificatory change in light of the change that was already brought about in the budget of 2021 in respect of amortization of goodwill. But these are the three, four things that have happened from an m and private equity standpoint. What are the things that have actually been missed out? We were all expecting to see direct overseas listing. We were expecting to see our startups actually be able to access capital from the overseas markets directly without having to list in India, without having to access the ADR, GDR route. I think this, this, was, this was a vexed issue. I think this continues to be under discussion. We were also expecting that we will be able to access PACs more easily, special purpose acquisition vehicles. Again, another form of overseas listing. And for that reason, cross-border mergers uh, will be made easier. I think we've missed out on this as well. Now, of course, there is a whole angle of saying, is it our stock exchange that should be strengthened or should we allow uh, corporates the free choice to raise money on an overseas stock exchange as well? Uh, and it's a fine balance that this government has to walk between strengthening your own investing climate versus being uh, providing corporates the ability to access overseas markets. Uh, perhaps uh, a large section of the industry does believe that allowing access to all sorts of capital is in the end beneficial for the Indian economy, but the government seems to have put both of these measures on the back burner. The third one that was expected was around tax parity on exits. And while this has partly been done by addressing the surcharge on unlisted stock, but the base tax rates for residents versus non-residents still remains different, uh, one at 10%, one at 20%, and therefore full tax pa parity on exits between non-resident and resident investors is still not achieved. These are things that we will we will look out for in the coming days, maybe budget 2023. But this was a quick roundup of the M&A and private equity venture capital takeaways from budget 2022. With that, I will turn it to my colleague Parizad, who will walk us through the personal tax changes. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, uh, you know, the step towards a personal tax reform over the last three years, there were a plethora of changes from a personal tax perspective. So in moving with the theme of a stable, predictive, trustworthy regime, uh, there aren't any changes from a personal tax standpoint. Can I have this slide up, please? Thank you. So there is really no change in the basic income tax slabs or you know, any tinkering of the tax rates per se. While the wish list of the common man who reeled through three pandemic, three waves of the pandemic was some amount of you know, extension of the leave travel concession scheme or specific carve out to incremental and additional COVID related expenses, coupled with the fact that the future of work has changed and there are a lot of you know, work from home expenses that employees incur and reimbursements made by the employer. There were a lot of wish lists to that account. That's not found its way in the fine print. However, uh, you know, last year around June uh, 2021, there was a press release considering what we as citizens of the country have reeled through under the COVID pandemic. The press relieved had specified certain expenses uh, to be exempt on COVID related uh, you know, expenses. Enabling provisions have now been uh, brought about in budget 2022, which clarifies that any sum uh, on expenses towards COVID that uh, the employer may give to the employee for self and family uh, is not going to be taxable as perquisite or salary income. It also has made changes to Section 56. Uh, any ex gratia payment, again, made by an employer on the debt of a person uh, to the next of kith and kin is not going to be taxable. That has no limits if the ex gratia is provided by the employer. However, any other person, if it's you know, helping the family members on debt of a person due to COVID, there is a ceiling of 10 lakhs. Beyond that, it's taxable. Up to 10 lakhs, it's not going to be taxable. 
a specific deduction for differently able people if the insurance policy was taken by the parent or the guardian under Section 80 BD is already prescribed currently in the Income Tax Act. The deduction is up to 75,000, 1,25,000 per annum. However, currently the way it was worded was that the only if the payment was, you know, the annuity if received on the debt of the policyholder, only then the deduction was allowed. Recognizing the hardship and taking into account the cognizance of the Supreme Court case law in the case of Ravi Agarwal, it is now clarified that for the purpose of this deduction under Section 80 DD, uh, even if the policyholder now uh, you know, reaches an age of 60 years uh, in the policies on a differently able person, uh, you know, he or she should be able to claim the deduction, which is a welcome move. Uh, to bring parity between central and state government employees, uh, the enhanced deduction for employer contribution towards the NPS for state government employees is also now uh, made at 14% from the existing 10%. Sunil has already covered uh, the virtual digital assets, so I'm not going to you know, get into depth or details on that. But if we as you know, investors have you know, invested in any kind of this virtual digital assets, as he clarified the wideness of the ambit, you might have to take a look at your personal tax liabilities on account of this asset class as well. Is that the, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, with this all in all, you know, uh, while the room to balance the fiscal deficit was also uh, quite little, there aren't really any significant changes from a personal tax perspective because over the last two years, as I said, a humongous amount of changes that happened on retiles and other stuff. Uh, so with this, I'm gonna, you know, hand it over back to Rajiv to take us through the indirect tax proposals. Thank you so much. Thank you, Parizad. Uh, let me, this is the last segment of our presentation, uh, talking about uh, GST and customs related changes. Uh, let me take up the GST first. Uh, can I have the slide, please? A uh, couple of uh, favorable uh, amendments to rationalization. Uh, first is something that has been a major demand of the taxpaying community that if I have excess credit in one state, I should be permitted to transfer that excess to another state of my own branch. Uh, and that has been a major demand of the, of the industry. Uh, so far, what has been permitted is cash ledger balance can be transferred. Uh, although the industry's demand was all credit, including input credit, but uh, I guess that is something to be done in future. So uh, it's, a, it's a great step in the right direction where uh, excess of tax in one state for the same government, uh, which was not being utilized, uh, in another state, at least now that is permitted. So a great, uh, you know, proposal here. Uh, second, which is, uh, you know, this constant debate that if I have taken an input and utilized, uh, should interest apply at the stage where I have utilized a credit which later might get disputed, or is it only to the extent that I've utilized and therefore short paid taxes if my credit is disputed? This, this, this debate was settled in the service tax regime it resurrected in the GST regime, and I'm glad it is again being, you know, uh, solved. Where the interest will only apply to the extent I have utilized the credit, which is later not been denied, uh, because to that extent the government didn't get the tax on time, and therefore interest for that amount for that period, uh, I guess, makes sense. The third is actually uh, a further relief to the all, all the taxpayers, uh, as you're aware, currently. For the entire year, by the following 30th September, uh, all the activities connected with taking input credit or issuing any credit notes or rectification of any of the details that you might have filed in your 12 periodic returns or, or whichever is your frequency of your return or any rectification that you need to do, the time limit to carry out all those was 30th September. You now get additional two months going forward, so more time to uh, deal with uh, all the internal uh, matters and correcting your returns. But the last bullet point here is where the powers are being enhanced to allow the, the authorities to take some drastic measures, whether it is to do with, uh, you know, imposing limits on the way you can utilize your credit balances. Uh, they could actually set maximum proportions to which you can utilize the credit. 
they could block your credits in specified cases or withhold refunds. Now, all these, of course, are not carte blanche. Uh, they will be under specified circumstances. But the fact that these powers do get in on one hand, yes, there are a number of cases that we see where there is actually evasion and therefore these powers make sense. On the other hand, we are always afraid whether these powers will be exceeded. Uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, somewhere we will experience it, but this is something that I'll be watching out for as it develops and unfolds uh, in this country. Moving on. On the custom side, uh, I did cover it in my opening context that there's very interesting announcement about uh, SEZ reforms, uh, which means that the whole construct of SEZ uh, is set to change. Uh, while it's not been announced in great detail, part of it, I suspect, is to try and make our laws more aligned to the WTO restrictions. As you're aware, a couple of years ago, India did lose uh, its case at the WTO on export subsidization. Number of schemes uh, were held to be uh, against the WTO. So there is generally an effort going on to make all our export incentive program uh, compliant with the uh, with the WTO. So perhaps this is part and parcel of that. But it's not just the law, it's the whole administration that is set for change, including more uh, digital uh, you know, platform, more digital intervention. So look out for this space. I think there'll be uh, interesting action in this space in the next few months. Uh, there was a debate and it was a famous case uh, in the case in, for Canon, which was a Supreme Court case, which uh, ruled that the DRI officers did not have power to pass orders or issues Supreme Court uh, issues show cause notices. And this has been a matter of great debate. I think a fine balance has been created in this budget where on a go forward basis, regardless of who the investigating agency is, the show cause notices will have to be issued only by one authority, which is your jurisdictional uh, officer and not by multiple agencies, which is part of the problem that was being faced by the taxpaying community. Whereas for the past, the notices that have been issued, which were uh, held by Supreme Court to be not valid, have been regularized. So at least past, they've tried to regularize, but on a go forward basis, I do certainly welcome uh, this, this proposal. Uh, on the import side, we did see a uh, you know, change uh, in the law two years ago where the certificate of origin or the origin requirement had to be fulfilled by the importer and not just the exporter in the country, which created a, a host of issues for people who were using a free trade agreement because the importer had to fulfill uh, all the requirements of proving the origin of the goods. Now, for certain activities and for certain transactions which will be notified by the board, there will be additional data points of proof that the importer will have to submit to defend their transaction value. Uh, I'm assuming this will be done for uh, those transactions which are susceptible to uh, you know, different uh, games of valuation. But again, this is something we'll have to see how the government employs or deploys these powers. The last uh, point on the slide is that we, we, we have seen the advanced ruling uh, and it was gaining grounds under customs. Uh, the, the current provision says that the advanced ruling once granted will be valid only for three years. Uh, that creates a very interesting debate that if the law does not change and if the facts does not change, why should advanced ruling uh, you know, phase out in a three year period and what happens after that? Uh, can the debate on the transaction that I've done for last years restart. Uh, so more analysis is needed. The intention of the government needs to be understood, but something that uh, I find very curious and therefore I want to point it out. Moving on. Uh, you would see if you go through the budget papers, reams of paper on, you know, various tariff changes. In effect, what has been done is what has been called as tariffization of uh, unconditional exemptions. Uh, as, as you all are aware, we have tariff, an exhaustive tariff for each item and an applicable rate of duty. But the effective rate of duty is determined by the notification that get announced. And therefore, for anyone who has to determine the applicable rate of duty has to first go through the tariff and the relevant notifications. At times, there is conflict in the notifications. So to simplify, uh, all the unconditional exemptions are now being baked into the tariff itself, and therefore the 
exemption notifications will actually become redundant. Uh, it also means that any new exemption that has to be granted, if it is unconditional, that will be done in the tariff and not through notifications. So it will make the whole process more streamlined, the data and the reliability of information will become that much better. So it's a great welcome move. Uh, also, we saw in the announcement, which is part and parcel of the larger Atman Devar Bharat, uh, where any concessions on capital goods will be phased out. Uh, and therefore, as we saw in the, in the speech, that this is to try and create a benefit to the domestic industry rather than having concessional imported goods coming in, let there be a domestic industry that should come up. So this is directly in line with our Atmanirva Bharat. And as we had seen uh, last year, that there was a clause that was inserted that all notifications will have a shelf life of two years and they will automatically uh, expire after two years. And if they need to be extended, then there will be an act further to be done. And therefore that sunset will start happening from 31st of March, uh, during 31st March 23 to 24. So notification that were issued uh, will set to expire unless they are extended. And the project import duty rates for capital goods for different type of projects, which currently ranges from two and a half to five percent over a period of time, will gradually move up to seven and a half percent, which means the concession will uh, will go away. So while it will benefit the domestic industry, hopefully it will give Philip to the local manufacturer. Uh, projects that are in pipeline and have accounted for their duty at a rate lower than seven and a half percent, the economics of those projects will have to recede. Uh, of course, we saw uh, all the Im important tariff changes, whether it is on manufacturing of wearables, uh, hearables. And again, this is trying to create a local manufacturing, just as we provided incentive for the smartphones. I think that is being extended to various other smart devices. Uh, so those are, again, you know, tariff rationalization is to create an environment for local manufacturing. Moving on. So... Friends, we, as, as Gaurav also mentioned, there's just been hours since the budget was presented uh, and by the time the material was uploaded. Uh, this is just the headlines. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, each of these clauses uh, will be debated at length. And as we go through the fine print, uh, some more data and information will emerge. So this space will remain interesting and exciting. We will keep coming out with our news alerts as we analyze more and more data. But for this evening, we felt these are the important points which we wanted to bring to your attention. So thank you for your time and thank you for your attention. Uh, good evening and goodbye.